Formula 2, we all know it. The racing series self-branded as the road to F1, allowing prospective drivers to chase the dream. But for most current drivers in the series, all F1 will ever be to them is a distant, elitist, clicky, unachievable dream. We have seen the last three Formula 2 champions have outstanding years in the series, but when they achieved the feat, all they agreed with was an option to be a reserve driver for a middling team. This begs the question, why is F2 failing to prepare its drivers for Formula 1? Or is Formula 1 failing Formula 2? Since the rebrand from GP2 in 2017, Formula 2 has been acting as a de facto Formula 1 feeder series. It has 11 teams with 2 drivers apiece, for a total of 22 drivers. This series follows F1 around the world, with the current season having 14 rounds, allowing the drivers to experience the strain of a Formula 1 season could have on you. Some of these names are notable. World Champion title contenders such as Charles Leclerc, Lando Norris, Oscar Piastri and George Russell have all graduated through the series, as well as some more obscure ones such as Jack Aitken, Liam Lawson and most recently, Oliver Behrman. Now let's go into some numbers that show the decline in drivers being promoted from F2 compared to the past. So far, 96 drivers have raced in the series, with 16 drivers graduating to Formula 1. That gives a success rate of 2 drivers a year. GP2 managed to promote 35 drivers in a span of 11 years. That is more than 3 drivers a year. One driver more per year than the current Formula 2 feeder series, which shows less drivers are being promoted now more than ever before. Of the 16 drivers to get promoted from F2 to F1, just under 40% of these have been dropped after one season or less. Comparing that to GP2, only 20% of drivers got cut after a year. Rookie drivers are now being cut from Formula 1 twice as often, which even suggests F1 teams are being more brutal than ever before, or that Formula 2 isn't preparing drivers sufficiently for the requirements of F1. 2024 is the first year that a driver has not been promoted to a full-time F1 seat from F2 or any other feeder series. That includes series of the past, such as GP2 and Formula 3000, which was a feeder series even before GP2. That spans all the way back to 1985. That is indicative of a lack of confidence F1 has in the current F2 package and shows that the issues Formula 2 are having are more prominent in recent years. But why are the usual barriers to entry for an F1 prospect more difficult to overcome now compared to the last however many years since 1985? And why can't this crop of young drivers overcome them? The first barrier all teams consider should be skill and pace, although that is not always the case Nikita Mazepin, Kokkoff, we can always usually tell the most skillful drivers and fast drivers from where they stand in the F2 Championship, and this typically has been the case with drivers such as Charles Leclerc, George Russell, Lennon Norris and even Alex Albin who all placed highly in their seasons. Formula 2 is a spec series, so although each team can adjust the setup of the car, essentially all cars should be equal. Looking at the past 5 years, we can see that back in 2020, the previous year champion was not given a seat. Nick DeVries had a settle for being a Dark Lord sidekick, and he wouldn't be the only one, but the 2020's champion, Mick Schumacher, after being given 2 years in house, got moved aside and is now the Padawan to Toto Wolf. Fifth place finisher, Nikita Mazepin, also got a half seat the following year, but got removed after his debut season. 2021 was a year of Oscar Piastri, and there are few as talented as his showing. He is the winningest driver F2 has ever had, but even he did not do enough to earn a seat with his then affiliated team Alpine. He did manage to switch boats to McLaren, but only after a couple of years. Third place Zhou Guangyu did earn a seat for the following season at Alfa Romeo, but he looks likely to be replaced for 2025 and left without a seat. The next season, Felipe Drogovic left everyone in his dust as he ran away with the championship. He also didn't get a seat and is now Aston Martin's reserve driver and probably is antagonised by Alonso's willingness to keep driving. However, Logan Sargent who came fourth and placed worse than his teammate Liam Lawson did earn a seat at Williams, which now looks likely to be Carlos Sainz's. Liam might be in a chance at RB, but it's still yet to be determined with Alpine also interested in 2025. Last year, in 2023, Porsche improved on a second place result the year before and won the title, but no luck. Sauber did not have a seat, so he went to Super Formula in Japan for a race, then switched to IndyCar with McLaren, although that has been now been revoked due to no fault of his own. Other candidates for seats were Frederick Resti, who fought for the title but could not get a Mercedes or Williams seat, 
Jack Dillon, who was actually in the race for an Alpine seat for 2025, and Ayum Awasa, who was in, the, in a long line of drivers wanting a second RB seat. This year, we have three drivers looking like title contenders. First off, there's Paul Aaron, who, although coming third in the F3 in 2023, got his support dropped by Mercedes. He's currently first in the championship and has been the most consistent driver, despite not having won an F2 race to date. He has not in talks for an F1 seat that we know of. Second is Isaac Hedger, and has arguably challenged Aaron as the best driver, winning multiple races and looking super quick. He's also probably the most likely of the top three to get a seat in the future, with his Red Bull links, although with the current predicament at RB, he was unlikely to get a seat, at least for 2025. Then there is Zane Maloney, who despite having Red Bull sponsorship last year, got dropped. He sits third in the championship, and has looked unbeatable at times in F2 this year, also likely not to have a seat. The two guys currently in talks for a seat are Kimi Antonelli and Oliver Mammon, who at the time of recording sit 9th and 17th respectively. This compounding history of after champions struggling for a seat the following year makes it seem like no longer are the best performers rewarded with seats like in the early days of F2 and stretching back to GP2. Now affiliations are more key than ever. What you hear a lot about when F1 teams speak about their young drivers is their development plan. Now alongside the F2 commitments, both Oliver Bannerman and Kimi Antonelli have private development plans that include running in various FP1 sessions, private running inside the outdated F1 machinery, which is funded by the F1 teams, and a time of time in F1's highly expensive simulator. So even on track, in race competition, drivers now might not need to show pace to obtain a seat. They will be showing their pace in the amount of additional development they have received. This creates an even greater conundrum that isn't easily solved. How do you give young drivers who don't have any affiliations, either by choice or not, the same opportunities to drive an F1 machinery without spending millions of dollars or knowing someone important? F1 is nepotism at its finest, and I'm not here for it. Probably the most discussed component F2 can have a role in changing is the pace of its cars. Currently, there's usually a gap between 10 and 15 seconds difference, which is huge. A step up between series, and this was a notable issue for Logan Sargent who said, I think the gap between the cars is probably a bit too big for what it should be. And there's just so many more things to, that are adding to performance than just getting in the car and driving like you do with F2. What could improve the series' ability to, to prepare drivers for the step up would be to change the gap to around 5 to 10 seconds difference instead. That would make it more difficult to drive a stepping up from F3 to F2, but given how well rookies tend to perform in F2, maybe that isn't a bad thing. I mean, three separate drivers have won F2 as rookies, which has never happened in the F1 history. So making the gap between F3 and F2 larger would have significantly improved the amount F2 drivers would learn when they make the step up. And given most drivers spend so long in the series currently anyway, given the lack of F1 opportunities, they would have time to improve and push themselves to improve further. The gap between F2 and F3 currently is around 5 to 10 seconds, so pushing it to the back end of around 8 to 9 seconds wouldn't be that big of a step up. Andrea Kimi has managed to skip F3 altogether to compete, and so it is a viable option. It might take a while to implement this, but in the meantime, James Bowles has mentioned that the 2026 regulations appear to reduce the lap time of an F1 car significantly, with Val saying, fundamentally, the performance difference of an F2 car could be as small as a few seconds. Now, I don't expect that to stay for as long, as F1 teams are the great efficiency finders, and they will reduce their lap times as much as they can, and are not bound to a stock car like Formula 2. Another option to achieve giving F2 drivers more experience in F1 machinery could be buying an F1 simulator and a few years old F1 car and allowing testing time for F2 drivers and teams. Not only would this allow drivers to develop, but also other team members such as engineers and pit crews, as we often forget F2 is not just for the drivers. There'll be difficulties such as the cost of running and maintenance, who get to use it and when and so forth. So I would send the bills to F1 and let them pay for initiative and propose a performance-based initiative for testing time. Either based on championship standing, or if you get podium, you get a certain amount of testing time, etc. This would add further incentives to do well for both the teams and the drivers alongside the glory of winning. The last way I would suggest improvements is to be stricter with the penalty points system. You all know how exciting it is when a driver takes a race off for whatever circumstances, see Bamman and Saudi, or Lawson and Zandvoort. So increasing the points accrued or reducing the amount needed for a ban would allow for a reasonable occasional occurrence for a rookie driver to get a taste and shot at F1. Currently, the points assist system is a joke. Nobody has ever evoked it, with both Perez and Magnussen currently close. So this could lay out strict punishments for breaking rules while giving youth a chance. All of this would help drivers get in quicker cars for more time, 
which would ultimately help to improve the pace aspect of drivers, which is one of the qualities F1 teams look for. Another barrier that is a lot more contentious is the financial and promotional aspects of a driver. We may not like it, but some drivers have large sponsors or large fan bases that they have cultivated over decades. Perez is a good example. The large Mexican fan base, sponsorship from Telcel, a massive telecom company, and small sponsors like Disney, Nescafe, and Mobile. He brings a lot to his team. Now he might slack in the racing aspect at times, but with the money and fans he brings, it's a price some teams are willing to pay. Other notable drivers that have occasionally let the pace, but make up for it with other aspects mentioned above, could include Lance Stroll, Zhou Guangyu, Daniel Ricciardo, Yuki Tsunoda, and Logan Sargent. With the cost associated with running an F1 team, you can understand the teams taking this option, but it doesn't mean the fans have to like it or stand for it. This has become a more popular option for teams in recent years, with the surge of popularity of the sport, due to various factors including a busier schedule and drive to survive introducing F1 to a wider audience. Meanwhile, it is a completely different story for F2 drivers. Yes, you'll have the occasional pay driver who sits usually right at the back of every, every race, but most of the time, drivers are there because they deserve to be there. It always feels like there is enough seats in F2 or F3 for every driver who deserves to be there to be given an opportunity. I know there are some considerable costs, around a few million, to fund an F2 campaign, hence why a lot of drivers get into an academy, but nothing near the amount expected by an F1 teams where they consider pay drivers. For my research, most of the F2 grid income is usually from household savings, small regional company sponsorships, or via F1 academies. Their level of recognition is also much lower than F1 drivers. Let's look at their Instagram followers of some F1 drivers and F2 opposites. Huge differences all around, even for the higher profile F2 drivers. F1 teams and F2 itself could do more to provoke wider fan bases engaging with the series and build up popularity of these drivers, aside from the, the fans dedicated to watching Formula 2 consistently. I think the mandatory requirement to allow F2 drivers to sit in F1 sessions has done bits in helping build their reputation, but more exposure could be given. Let's be real, the qualifying for F2 takes place during the European and USA workday on a Friday, while typically also running races early morning Saturday and Sunday, which are busy times in motorsport enthusiasts' lives. Changing these times to a more suitable slot could be tremendous in supporting these drivers with their engagement, which in the long run could make them more competitive options when considering a driver for their fan bases and sponsorships. Some of the most interesting commentary happens when F2 drivers are allowed to commentate during pre practice sessions or post F1 sessions, and I would urge F1 to wrap this up. These are young, intelligent people who know racing, while being insanely passionate. Behind closed doors, with the increasing notoriety and popularity I'm suggesting pushing to F2 drivers, F1 could then help them find sponsorships for these guys, or these guys could bring sponsors to F1. The last barrier I've identified is the number of seats on the grid. There aren't a lot, and there is not the same amount of turnover you see in F2. And don't forget, some of them are the best in the world. You can't expect world-class drivers to be coming out of lower formula every year consistently. If you have 15 guys who are all world-class drivers that have sold relationships with the team, that only leaves five spots for other drivers. So the drivers that do come up may not actually be better than the prospects that F1 currently has. Drivers spending so much more years in the sport now than ever before. Let's look at Alonso, Hamilton, Ricardo, Bottas and Hulkenberg. And even Magnussen. 20 years ago, these guys would have already retired. Now with increased nutrition and training, these drivers are remaining elite for longer. And that consistency doesn't allow for driver turnover you might expect. When considering why drivers are staying at teams longer recently, with a little reshuffle, it makes most sense to start with the finances. With both the new cost cap and various financial crises occurring recently due to COVID and Russia's war in Ukraine, funds are tight and agreeing longer, cheaper term deals with drivers have benefits, especially if you're not consistently renewing and having to pay signing on fees. Now F2 can't do a lot to fix this issue, but F1 can. In 2026, when Andretti wanted to join the grid, yes, they might bring a driver from IndyCar, but they will also likely take a place of an experienced driver from F1, giving an opportunity to turn to an F2 driver somewhere on the grid. In the long run, this will also help with the number of seats. Other teams have expressed an interest to join the grid for F1, so such as Roden from F2, or F2 itself could run a team, however unlikely. Whatever the case, the decision rests with F1 and Limsy Media after FIA's approval of the Andretti bid. Now given the driver market shakeup happening this year for 2025, with Antonelli and Bamman looking to make the step up, don't expect it to continue. In 2026, there are new regulations, and traditionally, years before regulation changes have had little driver swaps, as teams want a consistent team and approach with a change happening to their car. 
So there's plenty of change this year, the problem likely only to get worse after that. 12F1 driver is currently under 27, with 6 over 33 in approaching retirement in the next couple of years. So although we might see a spike in the new drivers in 2027 and 2028, after that I would suggest the turnover falls off a cliff. F1 and F2 need to collaborate and act, as the drivers that they may be receiving from the feeder series might not be at the pace or recognition F1 would ultimately desire to continue building its brand of the world's greatest race. If you liked this video, please subscribe. This is a new star, so comment if you want to see more of this kind of content. Thank you for watching. Peace.